Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is the fourth video on introduction to oil and gas. In this video, we are going to talk about the conventional and non-conventional operations and exploration methods and procedures. These are the topics that we are going to cover in this video. Please like subscribe and share my channel to search for accounting lessons and hit the notification bell button to alert you for the latest video. For all of your questions, comments and suggestions, please put them in the comment section below. For webinar and guest speaker invites, please send me a message at accountingamir at gmail.com accounting is a k we hope that this video help students in their academic development and teachers in enhancing their lesson plans and teaching methodologies we also hope that this video help fresh graduates who have joined the oil and gas companies and want to refresh their learning on oil and gas Let us start with how organic shale is formed. Oil and gas typically begins with a muddy mix of fine sediments such as silt and clay combined with the organic remains of aquatic microorganisms called plankton. This organic mud can accumulate across wide areas of shore or on lake bottoms in locations where plankton is abundant. If the organic mud is covered by other sediments, it will compact into a type of rock called organic shale. Next, let us talk about the shale characteristics. The organic shale, deeply buried over millions of years, is exposed to increasing levels of the earth's heat and the organic matter begins to convert into oil and gas. The silt and clay grains in shale are tiny and stacked in a tight pattern which makes the rock nearly impermeable. As a result, if a well is drilled into source rock, very little oil and gas will make its way through the rock to the well bore. However, a portion of the oil and gas that escapes over time can accumulate in areas where it is easier to produce. Accordingly, if the oil and gas that escapes the source rock encounters porous and permeable rock, such as sandstone or limestones, buoyancy forces the oil and gas upward through the pore spaces. If the oil and gas encounters an impermeable layer, layer that blocks its upward migration, it may begin a lateral migration along the layer boundary. If the migrating oil and gas encounters a trap, a structure that it cannot escape, then oil and gas will begin to accumulate in the tap in the pore spaces. We have already talked about different types of traps in the first video. We will talk more about trap in the next slide. A conventional trap can usually be developed with vertical wells because it contains a concentrated accumulation of oil and gas, a much higher concentration than in the source rock. The rock is porous, meaning that it can hold a lot of oil and gas and the rock is permeable, meaning that oil and gas can flow through the rock into well bores. Isolated traps 
can be spread over a wide area of source rock and is present but not all the structures that look like traps on seismic will contain the oil and gas. As a result, conventional oil and gas drilling results in isolated areas of productivity and a lot of risk is involved in finding those areas. Next, let us talk about conventional and unconventional shale and tight rocks. Most of the conventional oil and gas areas have been extensively explored over time. Most attractive trap like structures have been drilled and largely depleted. Around the year 2000, a combination of strong oil and gas prices and advances in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing technology began to make it economically feasible. To produce from the source rock layers or other poor quality rock layers that contain migrated oil and gas commonly called tight rock. For example, most of the drilling in the Eagle Ford and Marcellus Marellis area is a shale source rock. Whereas most of the drilling in the DJ basin and the Bakken is tight rock. Let us talk about horizontal drilling. Shale and tight rock layers easily accommodate horizontal drilling because they span wide areas with few interruptions allowing large working areas without dry hole risk. However, layer thickness and characteristics are not always uniform causing some areas to be better than others. Horizontal wells are drilled down vertically or mostly vertical until they get near the target formation and are then curved into a horizontal direction and run long distances laterally to give the well bores extended exposure to the formation. For example, a vertical well piercing a 100 foot thick shell layer would only have a 100 feet of exposure to the oil and gas interval. Whereas a horizontal well would have several thousand feet of exposure. Hydraulic fracturing further extends the drainage pattern around horizontal well bores by creating fracture patterns that facilitate flow. Finally, let us talk about exploration methods and procedures. We have just established what kind of structures tend to trap oil and gas in the earth's crust? But how do we locate potential traps underground? One technique is seismic surveys. In this technique, a vibrator truck fires shock waves into the ground. The shock waves pass through the, through the rock layers and bounce off others. By restoring, recording how long it takes for the shock waves to arrive back at the surface allows geologists to build a picture of the internal structure of the rock beneath their field. Next, let us talk about drilling the well. A potential oil trap is called prospect. Once a prospect has been identified, the next stage is to drill a hole into the top of the trap to see if it contains oil and gas. It is incredibly expensive to a drill hole. An offshore rig may cost more than 10,000 for every meter drilled. So if you are going to drill a hole 5,000 meters underground, 
it is going to cost about 25 million dollars. Consequently, geologists have to be pretty confident that they are going to hit the oil. If they don't drill too many, if they drill too many dry holes, they will soon lose their job. I will be making a separate video on drilling the well. Next, let us talk about how to enhance recovery of oil. If the geologist is lucky, he will strike oil and gas. A hole which contains oil and gas is called a well. The oil and gas is under considerable pressure in the earth's crust. So once a well is drilled into the reservoir rock, the oil and gas rapidly rises to the surface. However, as more and more oil and gas comes out of the well, eventually the pressure drops and flow slows down. To get the remainder of the oil and gas out of the reservoir rock, a second hole is drilled adjacent to the first one. Hot water or steam are pumped down the hole and this forces the oil and gas still trapped in the rock go up the original well. This technique is called enhanced recovery. Once the oil and gas has been extracted from the ground, next it must be safely transported from the well to the refinery. Let us see how it is done. Oil is usually transported from the well to the refinery using pipelines. These pipelines may stretch over land or be laid over the seabed. A spectacular, spectacular example of an oil pipeline is the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, which carries oil and gas for 1300 kilometers across Arctic, Arctic permafrost. Another way that oil and gas are transported is by means of massive oil tankers. These gigantic vessels can carry up to half a million tons of oil. Once the oil reaches the refinery, the next step is to refine it. And let us see how it is done. At the refinery, the crude oil, which also contains a lot of gas, is processed. This involves separating oil from uh, separating out all the different hydrocarbons in the crude oil. To do this, the crude oil is heated in a furnace and then passed through the cooling tower. The method relies on the fact that different hydrocarbons have different boiling points. Consequently, the heavy hydrocarbons like bitumen with high boiling points accumulate at the bottom of the cooling tower. Light hydrocarbons like paraffin with low boiling points accumulate near the top of the top. This process is known as fractional distillation. The different hydrocarbons have different uses. For example, bitumen is used to surf surface roads while paraffin is used as aviation fuel. So this completes part 4 on introduction to oil and gas where we talked about the conventional and non-conventional operations, exploration methods and procedures of oil and gas. Remember effective questioning brings insight which fuels curiosity which cultivates wisdom. If you have any question regarding this session, then please don't hesitate to ask in the comment box or by email and inshallah, I will reply you back. Thank you so much and happy learning.